أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين وصلى الله على سيدنا محمد وآله الطيبين الطاهرين اللهم صل على محمد وعلى محمد Respected brothers and sisters, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. I sincerely welcome you to our first class in examining the greatest and the most powerful book after the Holy Quran, which is Nahj al Balagha, attributed to the commander of the faithful, Al Imam Ali ibn Abi Talib. Salam. Ibn Abi al Hadid. He is a very famous scholar, a Mu'tazili scholar, a Sunni Mu'tazili scholar. He gives a description that fits only one book in the history of humankind. In describing this book, Ibn Abi al-Hadid al-Mu'tazili states, Duna kalam al-Khaliq وَفَوْقَ كَلَامِ الْمَخْلُوقِ In describing this book, he says, it is below the speech of the Creator, but above the speech of the created. Meaning this book cannot match the book of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the Holy Quran. It's below the speech of God. The Word of God is above it. But when you compare it to the speech of all creation, of all human beings besides the Holy Prophet it is فَوْقَ كَلَامِ الْمَخْلُوقِ It comes higher than any other speech that human beings are familiar with. And you, here you have a Sunni scholar who makes this testimony. And Ibn Abi al-Hadid has a commentary on Nahj al Historically, it is the most important commentary on Nahj al balagha It's truly fascinating. In which he examines the sermons, the letters, and the maxims of Al-Imam Amir al-Mu'mineen alayhi salam. The book Nahj al balagha is a book that mesmerizes the intellect whenever you examine it. It literally explodes with knowledge. It added new dimensions to the human intellect, to theology, to history, to politics, to economics. You will find amazing references to all these sciences in Nahj al balagha But unfortunately this book has been oppressed by Muslims throughout history. God has given us such an amazing treasure and the reality is throughout history this book has been neglected. So we dedicated this course to first of all benefit from the content of this great book. Secondly, to appreciate the eloquence that Amir al-Mu'mineen would use in conveying the truth. That is why the book is called Nahjul Balagha. What does Nahjul Balagha mean? The path of eloquence. The one who compiled it could have given it a different name. The path of truth, the path of Islam, something else. But he chose a very interesting title, the path of eloquence. Because no book other than the Holy Quran, which is higher than Nahj al-Balagha, really matches Nahj al-Balagha in its amazing eloquence in the Arabic language. Now the first point that we need to discuss as an introduction to Nahj al-Balagha and before we actually examine the letters and the speeches of Imam Ali salam, is the authenticity of this book. Is this an authentic book that really was said by Imam Ali ibn Abi Talib salam? Because you have some scholars from other schools of thought, there are some Sunni scholars who have raised doubts about Nahj al-Balagha. They have claimed that this is not an authentic book, it has not been verified that these speeches and sermons were said by Ali ibn Abi Talib salam. And their claim is that this book was compiled by Al-Sharif Al-Radi. The one who compiled the book is Al-Sharif Al-Radi. They've accused him of authoring the book and attributing it to Imam Ali ibn Abi Talib salam. So it's very important as we start 
our examination of Nahj al-Balagha to examine the authenticity of this book. Is this an authentic book or not? Now let's briefly examine the life of al-Sharif al-Radi. Who was he? Because Nahj al-Balagha that we have, we have uh, I've placed an order on the books, we should be getting them by next week inshallah. Nahj al-Balagha that we have, it's, auth, it's compiled, the one who compiled it was Ash-Sharif al-Radi. So it's very important to understand who this important scholar is. Ash-Sharif al-Radi is his title. His name was Muhammad ibn al Hussein. He was a scholar and an acclaimed poet who lived in Baghdad in the 4th century in the Hijri calendar. So we're talking about a thousand years ago, a, million, a, million, a millennium ago. He was born in the year 359 in the Hijri calendar and he died in the year 406. So he wasn't that old when, you know, he was in his late 40s when he passed away. He died a young scholar. He is the fifth descendant of Al Imam Al Kadhim. So he was a descendant, a fifth descendant of Al Imam Al Kadhim. And if you trace his lineage back to the Imam Ali Salam, Imam Ali ibn Abi Talib, he's the twelfth descendant of Al Imam Amir al Mu'mineen. The father of Al Sharif al Radi held a very important position in Baghdad. At the time, the capital of the Muslim world was Baghdad in Iraq. His father was given the title Naqib al Talibiyin, basically, the one who would look after the Talibis. Who were the Talibis at the time? The Shia, the followers of Ahlul Bayt, or the descendants of Imam Ali and Fatima They were called the Talibiyin. Those who were followers of the Ahlul Bayt were called the Talibiyin. He was considered the protector of the Talibiyin. So in Baghdad he had a very important political position as well. When his father passed away, as Sharif al Radi took that position and title. He became the protector of the Shia and the one who would look after their affairs. As Sharif al Radi had an older brother who was called as Sayyid al Murtada. His title is Alamul Huda, the flag of guidance. His scholar was a top jurist. In our Islamic law and fiqh, you find his name being mentioned frequently. He produced many, many important contributions in Islamic law and legal theory. That was his older brother, Sayyid al Murtada. So we're talking about a very scholarly family. There's an interesting story mentioned that the mother of Sayyid al Murtada and Al Sharif al Radi, when you know they were young, they were children, maybe teenagers. She took them, or probably they were younger than that, she took them to a Shaykh al Mufid. Have you heard of a Shaykh al Mufid? Shaykh al Mufid is a top scholar in our history. She took these two young boys to a Shaykh al Mufid and she told them that I want you to make them great scholars. So they were educated by a Shaykh al Mufid. They had top scholars who trained them. And I want you to educate these two boys. So they were trained by Shaykh al Mufid and some other scholars. Al Sharif al Radi, the one who compiled Nahj al Balagha, he founded a school in Baghdad called Dar al Ilm. It was like a religious seminary, uh, an educational institution. So he is well achieved, and many, many scholars graduated from this school. Now, when it comes to Nahj al Balagha, he devoted 17 to 20 years of his life. Some historical accounts say 17, some say 20. Let's say about 20 years of his life, he dedicated to compiling Nahj al Balagha. He traveled to many libraries, to different cities, to collect manuscripts that had uh, the letters and the speeches of Imam Ali ibn Abi Talib. Salam. Any text that was attributed to the Imam, he would get a copy of it, and many of them. He included, it, he included them in Nahj al-Balagha. Now Nahj al-Balagha does not contain all of the speeches of Imam Ali, all of his letters. There are a lot of speeches that he left out, but it does contain a significant number of speeches and letters. Al-Shaykh, uh, Al-Sayyid uh, Sharif al-Radi, he was also a top poet of his time. When you examine his poetry, it's truly remarkable. 
He achieved a very high level of Arabic eloquence and he's considered one of the most eloquent scholars in our history. Now before we examine the authenticity of Nahj al-Balagha, why is Nahj al-Balagha such an important book? We know it's the words of Imam Ali salam, but let's briefly examine why Nahj al-Balagha is such an extremely important work, such that it is not an exaggeration to state that it is the most powerful book after the Holy Quran. Number one, Nahj al-Balagha represents the correct belief system. It represents a pure source from where we get our aqaid, our beliefs, our creed, our theology. Aqaid is the most important thing we have in our life. The Quran makes it clear that our belief is the most important aspect of our life. Now when it comes to any book that you pick up and it contains religious ideas, some ideas are valid, they're correct, sometimes they're not. And you always have that fear, you know, what I'm being told in this book, is it authentic or not? Is it the true religion of God or not? And sometimes we have to consult scholars to verify that for us. The only book that you can safely go to other than the Holy Quran and know that you're getting the knowledge from a pure source is Nahj al-Balagha. It represents the true correct belief system that we have. It's not simply, you know, people's opinions here and there. This is the word of who? Of, Medi of Bab Medina al Al, the Prophet says, I am the city of knowledge and Ali is the gate. So when you go to Nahj al-Balagha, you are going to the gate of the city of knowledge. That is an amazing pure source. I'll give you an example of how Nahj al-Balagha sometimes in an elaborate speech gives you the belief system, sometimes in short excerpts, in one-liners, the Imam salam addresses the proper belief system in such an eloquent and amazing way. So during the time of Imam Ali salam, there were two ideas, two sects, the Mujassima and the Mujabbira. The Mujassima were those who ascribed physical properties to God. God has a hand, God has eyes, God has physical properties. These people are called the Mujassima. And then you also had the people who were called the Mujabbira. The Mujabbira believed in predetermination, we have no free will. Every action that we commit is done by God because God creates everything. Don't we say that Allah created everything? Well, isn't my action a thing? If my action is a thing and God created everything, then God created my action. So if I commit a crime, I'm not to be blamed. God is the one who's responsible for it. He caused me to commit that crime. These people were called the Mujabbira. They believed that we had no free will. So the Imam Ali salam encountered these two ideas, the Mujassima, those who ascribe anthropomorphic qualities, physical qualities to God, and also the Mujabbira. The Imam salam in one amazing statement, few words, two words, literally it's two words, two small statements, he responds to these false ideas. Let's write what the Imam salam stated. The Imam salam was asked, مَا هُوَ التَّوْحِيدِ وَمَا هُوَ الْعَدْلِ What is Tawheed? What's the oneness of God? And what is Adl? What is the justice of God? So the Imam salam responded by writing, by saying these two words. At-Tawheed Allah Tatawahama Wal Adlu Allah. This is just a quick example. Tatahima. So I said, what was the question that he. The Imam was asked, Ma huwa Tawheed wa ma huwa al Adl. What is Tawheed? The belief in, in God. And what is the justice of God? Tell us about the justice of God. Ma huwa Tawheed wa ma huwa al Adl. And remember, at the time of the Imam, you had these two false ideas. Those who ascribed physical properties to God and those 
who claimed that God creates our actions. The Imam السلام, says two short statements. At Tawheed, what is Tawheed? Allah tatawahama. The Imam السلام, says Tawheed means not to limit God to your imagination. Do not subject God to the limits of your imagination. Any way in which you imagine God in your mind, you're limiting Him. So that means if in your mind God has a hand, He's got a physical body, you're limiting Allah. You know, oftentimes we picture God in our minds, right? A lot of people do. You have that image of God in your mind. The Imam says that image of God in your mind is not God. That's just a mental image that your mind created. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is not to be limited. And by the way, a lot of people who believe in God, they have a certain image of God. I once uh, came across a survey that asked Americans, those who believed in God, what do you think about God? What does God look like? Many of them gave the description of an old man with a long white beard. And they're worshipping God in church and that's their mental image of God. They really believe that if you were to see God, that's how you would see Him, an old man with a white beard. The Imam السلام, says true Tawheed means that you don't subject God to the limits of your imagination. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is above that. That's Tawheed. So any quality that limits God, having a hand, having a beard, having a place, having a body, the Imam السلام, says negate that from God. At Tawheed, Allah tatawahama. That's true Tawheed, when you could remove all these barriers and not picture God in a limited way, that's true Tawheed. That requires of course practice to tr truly know Allah and His attributes, oftentimes it's difficult to achieve that. You see with one phrase how the Imam السلام, explains that, one word, Allah tatawahama, one word in Arabic. The Imam السلام, gives you a university of ma'rifah and knowledge. The second phrase, وَالْعَدْلُ أَلَّا تَتَّهِمَ What does the justice of God mean? Do not lay any blame on God. What does that mean? That means if we're trying to decide, am I responsible for my actions? Do I create my actions or does God create my actions? What does the Imam here say? Don't lay any blame on God. What does that mean? Who creates the action? You! You're responsible for your action. Don't commit a crime and then say, oh God is responsible for it because He created my action. The Imam says, no, you have free will. Don't lay any blame on God. Allah enabled you, He gave you power and free will, but in the end you committed that action, not Allah. Two words from the Imam السلام, He beautifully gives you our aqaid, our belief system. Now to some of you this might be obvious, okay you know, that's obvious about God and that He's just. Brothers and sisters, until today, until today, the Ash'ari school of thought, which is the mainstream Sunni theology, they're not clear on this. When it comes to the Tawheed of God and picturing God, and putting limitations on God. Ibn Taymiyyah, have you heard of Ibn Taymiyyah? You know they call him Shaykh al-Islam, this very important scholar. He actually says, وَلِرَبِّنَا عَيْنَانِ نَظَّارَتَانِ He says, God literally has eyes. Bukhari says on the day of judgment, God puts his feet in hell, until hell says enough, enough. Bukhari says, Bukhari says on the day of judgment, you'll see God like you see the moon on a full night. The reason why we have the proper aqaid is because of Nahj al and the Imams of Ahlul Bayt. Appreciate them. Some of you might think, oh, you know, this is pretty obvious. It's not pretty obvious to most Muslims throughout history, to their scholars, let alone the average Muslim. Once you examine their theology, you find it problematic. And also, the second part the Ash'ari school of thought has problematic beliefs, which gives you the impression that, you know what? Our actions are created by God. It's not that clear in their theology that Allah is just. They firmly state that if on the day of judgment, Allah wants to put the Prophet in hell, He can. Doesn't have to abide by anything. He's the all-powerful, He can do whatever He wants. We, the school of Ahl-Bayt say, no. 
One of the attributes, fundamental attributes of God is His justice. Allah is just. He does not do anything that would violate justice. You see Imam Ali ibn Abi Talib mentioning all of this in two phrases. Now for those of you who are not familiar with Arabic, when I pr the way this is written, if you look at how these two words are written, tatawahama and tatahima, the writing of it and phonetically the sound of it, do you realize something about them? Similar. They're very similar. You see the eloquence of Amir al Mu'mineen alayhi salam, he gives you all that information in such an eloquent way that even phonetically sounds the same. Allah tatawahama, Allah tatahima. Sounds even identical to non Arabic speakers. Who can do that other than Amir al Mu'mineen? Succinct, straight to the point, concise, two words, they even sound the same. But they have different meanings, right? The first statement is saying something, the, the second one is saying something completely different. <coughs> Literally, all of Nahj al Balagha is like this, brothers and sisters. Every aspect of Nahj al Balagha is so deep and concise, and you can spend hours analyzing the words of Amir al Mu'minin. So, this is just one small glimpse, one small example of Nahj al Balagha. So, the Imam alayhi salam, he gives us the proper ma'rifah, the proper belief system. The more we study Nahj al Balagha, the better our belief system will be and the closer we will bring ourselves to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That's the first reason why Nahj al Balagha is such an important book. The second reason why Nahj al Balagha is such an important book is because it represents our correct history. We Muslims do not have a genuine, authentic history of early Islam. The first historian to really write about early Islam was Ibn Ishaq, the famous historian. He was amongst the early historians who wrote about the events of the Prophet's life and early Islam. When did Ibn Ishaq came, come? Did he live at the time of the Prophet and he witnessed all those events and he wrote them for us? Ibn Ishaq came nearly a century after, a century after the Prophet So our earliest source that we have comes a century after the Prophet. You have a century gap. So all of that information that is written in the common books of Seerah, the books of history, Ibn Ishaq, Ibn Hisham and others, how do we know how authentic they are when they came centuries after the Prophet? Some of them even came two, three centuries after the Prophet. There was a hundred year ban on hadith after the Prophet passed away. Those caliphs who came after the Prophet, they imposed a ban on spreading the hadith, discussing the hadith. In fact, they would punish anyone whom they would see, this is documented well, well documented in history. Even al dhahabi who is a very famous Sunni scholar, he says when Abu Bakr became Khalifa in one of his books, he had 500 hadiths that he himself had written. He says that night he did not sleep, his daughter Aisha realized her father did not sleep well. So she asked him, father what, what, what's bugging you? Why didn't you sleep well yesterday? He told her, I have you know, a stack of hadiths that I've written on pieces of paper, go bring them to me. She brings the hadiths, she gives it to him. Dhabi states, Dhabi, a very well respected Sunni scholar, what does he state? Well, do you know what he did to the hadiths? He burned all those 500 hadiths. Now when they were asked why, they're like, we want people to focus on Quran. Because if you have all these hadiths and people get confused, we don't want that happening. We want people to just stick to the Book of God. That was their, you know, philosophy. Whereas the Quran says, "Ma atakum al-Rasul The Quran says, "Whatever the Prophet delivers to you, take it." The commands of the Prophet, the seerah of the Prophet. In any case, there was a hundred-year ban on hadith. Later, a century later. A Khalifa comes, Umar ibn Abdul Aziz, he lifts that ban and then Muslims are now 
documenting the history of the Prophet. What happened in that century? So many information got lost, many people fabricated stuff, they made up stuff. We don't have an authentic history. That's very unfortunate and that's why we have so many problematic aspects in the Prophet's life that today you find even people in the West attacking us for that. The Prophet, 53 years old in Medina, marries six-year-old Aisha. This is because of this false history that we have. People who fabricated these lies against the Prophet and so many other things about the Prophet's life. So when it comes to Mahj al a big portion of Nahj al the sermons, the letters, the Imam السلام, gives us proper history. Nahj al is rich in history, in the true history. For example, one of the sermons of Nahj al is called Al Khutbah al Shikshiqiyya, the Shikshiqiyya sermon. Many, many Sunni scholars, they refute this sermon. They say, you know, this is not something that Imam Ali said. Sharif al Radi, the one who compiled Nahj al he made it up. The reason why they say that is because they're driven by politics. They don't like the content of that speech because the Imam exposes the deviation that happened after the Prophet. Those who unrightfully took the Khilafah and the Imam Ali exposes some of them. That's the correct history that we have. That the Imam Ali you know, preserve this for us. It's very important to have correct history. Because even today, even today in the media world that we live in, we see how the media twists facts, right? The perpetrator becomes the victim, the victim becomes the perpetrator. That's what the media does. That's exactly what the media does. So imagine back then, there, there was also a media, there was also a propaganda machine. You know, uh, just to give you uh, a couple very, very quick examples, I remember that a US official many, many years ago, of course later she changed and you know she repented of course, <laughs> she wrote a book about it. She was talking about Israel, you know what she said in one statement? She said, poor Israel is under siege, haram. Now Israel became the mazloom, the oppressed and it makes the perpetrator the victim. Right? They've occupied the lands and they've driven Palestinians out of their lands. And she said, poor Israel is under siege. That's what the media does. Well, you don't think at the time this was the same thing happened? The Abbasids, the Umayyads, those other caliphs, that's what they did. Because when you have a political establishment, those who write history are going to write it according to your interests. Not according to what's real, right? Not according to what's, what's the truth. And we see this every day. Today with what's going on in Yemen, uh, the, the Hashd al-Shaabi, the popular mobilization forces in Iraq. You know, ISIS when they invaded Iraq, you had faithful youth who went and gave their lives at the front lines to defend their land. I remember one Arabic channel, without mentioning any names, they did interview with people on the street, those who've been brainwashed by the media. They asked them about ISIS and about the Hashd al-Shaabi those Iraqis who were defending themselves, the popular mobilization forces. 70% of them said that the Hashd al-Shaabi, those youth are the criminals and ISIS people who came and occupied Iraq and they were spreading mischief are the mazloom and the oppressed. That's what the media does. Imam Ali ibn Abi Talib السلام, in Nahj al balagha he dispels many of these misconceptions. He gives us that authentic proper history. So this is the second reason why we really value Nahj al It gives us authentic history. Number three, the third reason why Nahj al amongst many other reasons is so important. No book other than the Quran gives you that maw'idah, that admonishment, that advice, those touching words like Nahj al Sometimes when you hear the sermons of Amir al-Mu'mineen reminding us of God, the day of judgment, how to be pious, they really, you know, send this chill down your spine. They are so effective. There's nothing more effective besides the book of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala than the words of Imam Ali alayhi One sermon really moves you, brings you closer to Allah. To give you a quick example, the Imam alayhi salam in one of his sermons, now the Imam Nahj al is full of hope, it gives us hope, it talks about the mercy of Allah. But remember at the same time, 
those who insist on their evil, there's a punishment for them. The Quran is very clear on that. The Imam alayhi salam captures that mo'idha, that admonishment that is very, very moving. In his sermons, when he says, in one of his sermons, he's talking, you know, about the sins that we constantly commit and we don't repent from them and we insist on our, uh, you know, aggression. The Imam alayhi salam shares with us these words. Wallahi, when you read these words, and you contemplate them, you know, the next time there's this opportunity to gossip, ruin someone's reputation, do haram acts, it really makes you think. The Imam alayhi salam in a beautiful khutbah, he says, وَعْلَمُوا عِبَادَ اللَّهِ The Imam says, O oh, servants of God, no, that this tender skin of yours, have you seen how tender the skin is? He says, I swear by God, this tender skin of yours, this soft skin of yours, can't stand the punishment of the hell. It cannot stand the fire of God. Then the Imam Ali Salam says, Afara'aytum farhamu nufusakum falaqad jarrabtumuha ala makarih dunya The Imam says, have mercy on yourselves. You've tried yourself in this world, in the pain and difficulty and the suffering of this world. Then the Imam gives three examples. He says, Afara'aytum jaza'a ahadikum min ash-shawkati tusibu. He says, you see how you lose patience, how you fall in despair and pain, when a small thorn scratches you, small thorn. You seen those nice flowers that come in these stems full of thorns? Or sometimes if you step, if you're walking and you step on a thorn, you see the pain it generates? The Imam says, a small thorn you can't handle. أَفَرَأَيْتُمْ جَزَعَ أَحَدِكُمْ مِنَ الشَّوْكَةِ تُصِيبُهُ وَمِنَ الْعَثْرَةِ تُدْمِي He says, when you trip, you fall, and you bleed, how that hurts. وَمِنَ الرَّمْضَاءِ تُحْرَقُهُ And if you go on a hot summer day in the desert, and you're walking barefoot, you've seen how hot the ground becomes, and you can't walk on it. Then the Imam السلام, states, فَكَيْفَ إِذَا كَانَ بَيْنَ طَابَقَيْنِ مِنْ نَارِ ضَجِيعَ حَجَرٍ وَقَرِينَ الشَّيْطَانِ The Imam says, then imagine being stuck between two layers of fire, sleeping on hot rock, and the shaitan is, is your companion in hell. These are real images, you know, oftentimes you hear people say, you know, don't talk about that punishment side, you scare people. I agree with you, we focus on the mercy of God more, because Allah is merciful. But at the same time, we can't ignore this reality. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions this clearly in the Qur'an. Those who insist and insist and they don't repent, the justice of Allah necessitates that they have to be held accountable. The Imam السلام, gives you these vivid big pictures in Nahj al -Balagha. They're so moving. There really no book is moving like Nahj al -Balagha. And the Imam السلام, says it so eloquently. You know, the beauty of Nahj al -Balagha is that all the sermons that Imam Ali السلام, gave, he gave them impromptu, without any preparation. Even the best speaker has to prepare, they need to know what they're saying. Imam Ali ibn Abi Talib would say all of these amazing words that carry knowledge, ma'rifah, history. They have multiple sciences embedded in them. In such a concise way like you've seen, words that even rhyme with each other. He says it instantly. That's the genius of Imam Ali. Once the Arabs challenged Imam Ali. They told him, you're so eloquent, give us a speech without the letter Alif, A, the equivalent of A in English. Can you, can you say a sentence quickly without having, it, having an A in it? <coughs> say it without preparation, impromptu, we can't. <laughs> because almost every word has an A. In Arabic, the most common letter is Alif. You say Bismillah, that has a few Alifs. You say Allah, any, anything that you say, Salamu Alaikum has an alif. Anything you want to say, the minute you speak, you're going to say an alif. The Imam alayhi salam mentions a full sermon without a single instance of the letter alif in it. And it's mentioned in the book, you can see it. Beautiful words, impromptu. Who other than Amir al muminin alayhi salam can say that? On another occasion, he was challenged again. They told him, Oh Ali, can you give us a sermon 
without mentioning a letter that has a dot on in it. You know the Arabic language has 28 letters. Half of them have a dot. For example, the ba has a period, has a dot under it, right? The ta, the sheen, the jim, for example. Half of the letters have a dot. They challenged him, give us a sermon without these letters. In other words, give us a sermon without half of the letters in the language. So in English, how many letters do we have in English? 26. 26. So if someone were to tell you, give me a speech with 13 letters only. Who could do that? The Imam salam give them that speech impromptu. Right on the spot, he de delivered that speech. It's also mentioned in the book, you could see it. It's amazing. The eloquence of the Imam salam is just simply baffling. And that's why despite all the civil wars and problems of his time, the Imam salam did move a lot of people. He really did. You know, have you heard of the Khawarij? The Khawarij were those group of people who rose against Imam Ali salam and they fought him at the Battle of Nahrawan. The Imam salam would admonish them. The words that he would use were so moving towards them. Once 12,000 of them had came, come out to fight him. The Imam Ali Salam gives them a speech. In his speech, he says, Amma ba'd. This is an example of how the Imam would admonish even his adversaries, his, his enemies. The Imam Ali Salam said, Amma ba'd, fa inna ma'asiyatan nasih, al shafiq, al alim, al mujarrib, turithul hasrata wa ta'qibun nadama. The Imam says, let me be honest with you, if you disobey the one who cares about you, he's honest with you, the one who's compassionate towards you, the one who's knowledgeable and the one who has experience, it will make you regretful, it will stir remorse in your hearts. See the Imam did not talk to them like the dictators that we see today in the Middle East and uh, you know acting so arrogantly. The Imam is telling them, I am, I'm your friend, follow me. Take my advice, stop your aggression in such a compassionate way, then he would give them the advice. And it worked. To a large extent it worked. Before the Battle of Nahrawan, according to some reports 18,000, according to some reports 12,000 had come to fight Imam Ali salam. When the Imam Ali salam gave them those amazing sermons and speeches, 8,000 of them changed. 8,000 of those khawarij flipped. They joined Imam Ali or they just walked away. 4,000 who remained who were, you know, uh, aggressive. 4,000. And even those 4,000, if Imam Ali salam would have spoken to them, if he had the opportunity, they would have also changed. But some of the companions of the Imam, they gave the Imam a hard time. You know, sometimes the Imam would send companions to talk to them. Ibn Abbas and others. Once the Imam salam dispatched one of his companions, he told him go and talk to them, but he told him don't argue with the Qur'an. When you're arguing with them, don't cite any Qur'anic verses because when it comes to the Qur'an, each one brings his own opinion. You're going to tell them about this verse in the Qur'an, they're going to say no, there's a different tafsir to it and they bring up their own tafsir. So it's useless, don't. The Imam salam told him what to say to them. Well, you know, unfortunately, sometimes the companions of the Imam, they wouldn't really obey the Imams. Sometimes they would insert their own opinions. He went and he started using verses from the Qur'an and arguing with them and he failed in his mission. He was not able to, you know, bring some sense into their minds. But the Imam salam, had he himself, sometimes he was, he, you know, the circumstances not allowed that. The Imam salam, when he would speak to them and give them the sermon, it would really move an entire army. Now by the way, uh, just for your information, that battle of Nahrawan, so 4,000 Kharijis, Kharijis are those extremists like the, we call them the, the father of ISIS, right? You know you've seen ISIS, people who act so um, devoted to Islam, they even memorize the Quran, they even pray and fast, but they're so extremist and they kill innocent people, those were your Kharijis. Once Imam Ali salam was walking with his companion Kumail. Kumail is a top companion of Amir al mumin Kumail passed by a man who was reciting the Quran so beautifully. He mesmerized Kumail. Kumail, he didn't say anything to Imam Ali. In his heart, he's like, wow, 
I wish I could be like this reciter of Quran. So much khushu and humbleness and beautifully he's reciting the Quran. The Imam السلام, looked at him and told him, Kumail, don't be so impressed by him. He's amongst the people of hell. Kumail was shocked. He, first of all, he didn't say anything to the Imam. The Imam السلام, was aware of his intention. Secondly, why? He's reading Quran and praying so beautifully. The Imam says, one day in the future you'll realize. Khomeini says, after the battle of Nahrawan, when those Kharijis came to fight the Imam of their time, Imam Ali, he says the Imam Ali was passing by and some you know, dead bodies lay on the ground after the battle. He says, we passed by a body. Imam Ali ibn Abi Talib told me, Khomeini, look at this man who was killed. Do you recognize him? Khomeini says, I looked, I looked at the face of that man. I told him, oh my Imam, he's that man who was reciting the Quran and I was impressed by his recitation. The Imam said, don't you see? He was on the enemy side fighting the Imam of his time, fighting Imam Ali alayhi Fighting the representative of the Prophet, the son-in-law of the Prophet, the Khalifa of the Prophet, the one who represents the Haq. The Imam said, I told him, see, this is his fate. Same thing with ISIS. Exact same thing with ISIS. You know, they come blowing themselves up, literally thinking that they're going to have breakfast or dinner with the Prophet These people were the, were the father of the extremists. The Imam السلام, he did guide many of them, but of course some of them were stubborn or some of the companions of the Imam, they had shortcomings in guiding them. But we see the Imam السلام, he really has that impact in his words and in his speech. So these are some reasons why Nahj al Balagha is such an important book. Now, Al Sharif al Radi, it took him about 17 to 20 years to compile this book. He gathered 242 speeches. So in Nahj al Balagha, we have 242 sermons. We have 78 letters that the Imam Ali Salam would write to various people and 490 maxims. You know what the maxims are? They're those very short statements that you find at the end of, the, of Nahj al-Balagha. Very short, concise statements that carry so much wisdom in them. So that's 242 speeches, 78 letters, 490 maxims. This is the Nahj al-Balagha that al-Sharif al-Radi compiled. Now most of the speeches that we have from Imam Ali, where were they delivered? They were delivered in his Friday sermons when he became the Khalifa. The Imam Ali Salam served as the Khalifa for about four. Of course, he is the Khalifa appointed by God. I'm talking about the apparent Khalifa, meaning when he ruled, his capital was Kufa. The Imam Ali Salam was the Khalifa for about four years and a few months. During the Friday sermon, the Imam Ali would give sermons. A lot of the sermons of Nahj al-Balagha come from those Friday speeches. Some of them come from the Eid speeches on Eid al-Fitr, Eid al-Adha, other important Islamic occasions. The Imam Ali Salam would give sermons. And some of these speeches come from the battles. Before a battle, after a battle, the Imam Ali Salam would often give sermons. At the Battle of Jamal, for example, he would, before he would give a sermon to guide people. After a battle, he would give a sermon. So most of the sermons that we have in Nahj al-Balagha, uh, they come from these sources. The Friday sermons, the Eid sermons, and the battles. Especially the three main battles. Jamal, the battle of the camel, battle of Safin, and the battle of Nahrawan. So now let's look at the authenticity of Nahj al-Balagha. Because as we said, some have raised some doubts. You know, who said these are the words of Imam Ali? Possibly a Sharif al Radi, he's the one who made them up. Now, the first person, as we know, the first scholar, the first Muslim scholar, who raised doubts on Nahj al Balagha was Ibn Khallakan. Ibn Khallakan was a 7th century biographer, 7th century in the Islamic calendar. He was a 7th century biographer and he did so mainly for sectarian and political reasons. He came, you know, a while after the Prophet and he raised some doubts about Nahj al-Balagha. After him, al dhahabi who is a famous Sunni scholar, he also raised some doubts about Nahj al-Balagha. Then came Ibn Taymiyyah. 
Ibn Taymiyyah just outright rejected Nahj al Balagha and he just accused Al Sharif al Radi of making it up. So there are some who have raised doubts about Nahj al Balagha. Now, Ibn Taymiyyah he brings an argument. Initially, it might appear like a valid argument, but we'll refute it. Ibn Taymiyyah says the entire book of Nahj al Balagha is Mursal. Anyone who took science of hadith last year, what does Mursal mean? Incomplete chain, broken chain. For example, when you open Nahj al Balagha, okay, Sermon 25, Imam Ali alayhi salam said so and so. What's your chain? What's your link? Al Sharif al Radi does not tell us the narrators who narrated Nahj al Balagha. Sharif al Radi came three centuries after Imam Ali. What is his link to the, to the Imam alayhi salam? Who are the narrators from whom he got these speeches? Ibn Taymiyyah says he does not give us that. Therefore, the entire book is called Mursal, meaning it's a broken chain and it's invalid. We cannot depend on it. This is his argument. Now, it seems like a legitimate argument, right? Because when, when it comes to any hadith, for that hadith to be valid, you need a solid chain uh, in which you have reliable narrators narrating that sermon, narrating that hadith, narrating that event. But Naj al Balagha has no chain of narrators. So how do we accept it? The answer to that, we mentioned the following points in establishing the authenticity of Nahj al-Balagha. Number one, there is a scholar by the name of Al-Mas'udi. Now the reason why he's called Al-Mas'udi, he's one of the descendants of Abdullah ibn Mas'ud, who was one of the companions of the Prophet Al-Mas'udi was a prominent Arab Muslim scholar. He died 13 years before Sharif al Radi was born. So before even Sharif al Radi, who compiled Nahj al was born, we have Al Mas'udi in his very important book. He talks about Nahj al Balagha and he witnesses the following. He gives us this witness, this account. He says, I witnessed my people in our societies memorize 480 speeches of Imam Ali. They know it by heart like they know it by name. He says, يُرِدُهَا عَلَى الْبَدَاهَ Just like some people, you know, memorizers of Quran, they've just memorized it so fluently. He says people in, the, in society at the time, Muslims, that's how memor that they memorized 480 speeches of Nahj al Balagha. Far more than what Al Sharif al Radi even gathered in the book. So basically, he's telling us those speeches were so well known, so widely circulated, not like the Quran and the authenticity of the Quran, but similar to the status of the Quran. Right now, when people read the Quran, do they have a chain of narration? This surah I got from so and so, from X, from X, he's reliable, he's reliable, from the Prophet. No. Why? Do we even need a chain for the Holy Quran? We don't. Why? How do we know it's valid? Yeah, but how do we know it's the words of Allah? We need to have a proper source that we need, we need. But how do we know the Prophet said it? We didn't see the Prophet saying it. What's that? It's never been changed. So we look at clues, right? The content is, is amazing, it's miraculous. But the fundamental point here is that the Quran is so widely circulated. Generation after generation of Muslims memorized it in this exam, exact same manner such that it gives us certainty that this was the Quran that was revealed at the time of the Prophet and that's how the companions memorized it. It's so widely circulated. Uh, you know, to give you an example of something that's mutawatir, so widely circulated, has any one of you been to Antarctica? Do you believe Antarctica as a continent exists on earth or no? Yes. You've never seen it, how do you know? You hear about it a lot. You hear about it a lot. Ex expand that a little bit further. Grow up and like listen. But maybe those pictures are made up, how do you know? Maybe they're photoshopped. <laughs> Like you know the whole controversy of the moon and landing on the moon, right? Some people believe it's photoshopped. <laughs> Why does it give you certainty? See, it's so widely reported from so many uh, scientists, so many people who took the journey. It's so widely reported. 
that you just know. Or let's go back before the age of technology. You know, our ancestors, they knew China existed, even though they never saw China. How? Maybe people were conspiring and telling lies. They made up this place called China. When so many people report something to you, it generates certainty that it exists. Same concept we apply to the Quran. So widely narrated and memorized that we believe these are the actual verses. Al Mas'udi, who's a top scholar, he says, and in our time, Nahj al Balagha was so widely circulated, people actually memorized it like they memorized the Quran. So when Al Sharif al Radi compiled Nahj al Balagha, he did not really need to include a chain of narrators because everyone knew these speeches belonged to Imam Ali. It was obvious, it was a no brainer. People even had memorized the speeches of Nahj al -Balagha. The minute you start the speech, people will just continue it for you. So in those circumstances, Sharif al radi did not find it necessary to include the chain. Okay, I got this from my teacher, from his teacher, from this companion, from Imam Ali. It was not necessary because they were so well known and established that there was no need for that. So that's one argument that we can use to establish the authenticity of Nahj al -Balagha. The second argument is that nearly every sermon in Nahj al -Balagha, we can find an earlier source to it. For example, the book of Kafi mentions about 41 speeches and statements of Imam Ali that are found in Nahj al -Balagha. Have you heard of Khutbat al-Muttaqeen? The Sermon of the Pious, it's a famous one. al kulaini in his book Al-Kafi which predates Nahj al balagha and al sharif al radi he mentions it. So if we examine the speeches of Imam Ali السلام, we can find other authentic sources that have mentioned it. So we actually do have a source for the sermons of Nahj al balagha Yes, Sharif al radi didn't mention it in Nahj al balagha but if we do research we find it in the book of Kafi, we find it in the book of Tusi, al saduq and these others. So we do have actually other sources. In fact, there is a famous Sunni scholar called Al-Jahid. Some of you may have heard of him. He's also a literary figure. He has a book called Al-Bayan wa Tabeen. In this book, he mentions many of Imam Ali's speeches. There is a source there. So when Ibn Taymiyyah says, you know what, there is no source, he's just making it up. No, we can find nearly all of the sermons in Najjal Balagha in other, in other sources, in other works. We also have the book of Al-Kamil by Ibn Al-Mubarrad, a top scholar. He also documents part of Nahj al -Balagha. We have Tariq Tabari, Tariq Yaqubi, Sunni books of history, and they also mention some of the speeches of Imam Ali alayhi salam. So Nahj al -Balagha by Sharif al radi is not our only source to these sermons. We have many, many other sources that confirm the authenticity of Nahj al -Balagha. Now the first person to actually write the speeches of Nahj al balagha was a man by the name of Zayd ibn Wahab al-Juhani. He wrote this in the year 96 Hijra. That's 300 years before al-Sharif al radi He documents many, many of the speeches of Nahj al balagha and he himself heard them from Imam Ali alayhi salam. He himself would hear them. He, there was another man by the name of Ubaidullah Ibn Abi Rafi'. He was a scribe to Imam Ali. You know Imam Ali when he was the Khalifa, he had a scribe, you know, like your bookkeeper, who would write important events, he would write important details. He would also write the speeches of Imam Ali as he's delivering the Friday sermon. As the Imam Ali salam was speaking, he would quickly write them. So we actually have early sources that support the validity of Nahj al balagha so this book is authentic beyond doubt and believe me the content of Nahj al balagha demonstrates it's from an infallible Imam. And you know I say the statement, if Sharif al radi was able to produce a book like this from his own mind, he's got to be the representative of God on earth. Because only the representative of God on earth who has that absolute knowledge from the Prophet can produce something like this. So let's follow Sharif al radi fine, let's call him Imam Ali from now on. It's, it's, it's preposterous to believe that Al-Sharif al radi compiled this book. That the power of its content 
indicates this is coming from Imam Ali alayhi salam. So we've examined the authenticity of Nahj al balagha Next week, inshallah, we'll examine some features of Nahj al balagha and then we will begin by examining the sermons and the letters of this book. Uh, yes, brother, you had a question? Well, everything in Nahj al balagha is from the last four years and nine months. It's only from while Imam Ali was there. The vast majority of the content of Nahj al balagha is from those four years. Some of it does predate that, but because the Imam was not given an active role in society, a lot of his words were not documented. So most of what we see, the letters especially, a lot of the sermons were during those four years, yes. So Nahj al balagha pretty much captures to you the last four years of Imam Ali's life. Uh, a sister had a question? Anyone else? Uh, but, but the name of the scribe, the the scribe Ubaidullah ibn Abi Rafi'. Ubaidullah ibn Abi Rafi'. Inshallah, we'll have the uh, book available by, by, by next week and we will give you uh, the book. It's Nahj al Balagha. Some of you may have other versions, that's fine. But the version that I will be using <coughs> is one that is edited by Yasin T. Al Jaburi. So those who registered for the class, we've ordered the book for you and we'll make it, we'll bring it to you inshallah. Wa sallallahu ala Sayyidina Muhammadin wa alihi al-tahirin. Allahumma salli ala Muhammadin.